Hello, friends, and thanks for downloading another weekly episode of the Money Girl Podcast. My name is Laura Adams. I'm a personal finance expert and author based in Austin, Texas, who's been producing this show since 2008. Last week, I answered a question about how parents should handle vehicles and insurance when they have kids away at school. So don't miss that one for some important tips to protect your belongings and liability when you've got a family member who's driving out of state or temporarily living away from home. And if you're thinking that you'll never be able to pay for a kid's college, this show is for you. You probably know that the cost of higher education continues to rise year after year at most schools. In podcast number 498, I interviewed a scholarship expert about how to find free money to pay for college without loans. While there is a lot more scholarship funding available to students than many people think, it's still wise to begin saving for college as early as possible. And one of the best ways to pay for college is a special account called a 529 savings plan. It's also known as a qualified tuition program. These accounts are a great way to save because they come with some built-in tax advantages that are designed to help you save as much as possible. The 529 plan was created in 1996, and its strange name comes after its section of the Internal Revenue Code kind of like the 401k does. More than 12 million families have used 529 plans to save more than $258 billion for higher education. So if you've ever wanted to know more about how these 529 plans work, I want you to stay with me. In today's show, I interview Christopher Krell, who is a nationally recognized certified financial planner and a 529 expert. He's been helping clients choose fund, and manage these savings plans for many years. We discuss how to choose the right 529 plan and talk about a lot of tips to use them the best ways possible, no matter if you're saving for your own education or you're trying to help a child or even a grandchild go to college. Some of the important topics we cover in the interview include Of course, the major benefits of using a 529 plan. We also talk about the two main types that you can choose from. We cover who can use a 529 to save for higher education expenses, and then what the money can be used for once you've got it in one of these accounts. We talk about what happens to 529 savings if your child can't or doesn't want to go to college or prefers a different school than you hoped. We talk about how to know which state's plan is best for you, and Christopher even recommends a couple of his favorite states. We talk about how to estimate the right amount to save and how a 529 plan affects your eligibility for federal financial aid and a lot more. This is episode number 504 called, Should You Use a 529 Plan to Pay for College?, Now, here's my conversation with Christopher Krell. Christopher, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Uh, Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be talking with you. I've got a lot of listeners who are parents, of course, and they are very interested in how to save for kids' college. And I know that 529 plans are one of the best ways to save, but a lot of people still have questions about them. They're not really sure how to get started or what the benefits are. So I'm hoping that you can clarify some of the most common questions for us today. Let's just start with what is a 529 plan? So a uh, 529 plan really is the best way to save for uh, your children's or grandchildren's uh, college expenses. So ultimately what it makes it so great is that it's a, it's a vehicle that allows you to put money in, get a tax deduction, it allows the money to grow tax deferred, and then it allows for the money to be distributed tax free. So ultimately there is no better vehicle out there um, even in comparison to retirement accounts like Ross and so on and so forth. So the 529 plan is something that I think everyone needs to consider as a vehicle to save for the rising cost of tuition in college. And let's talk about who can use them. Is there any limitation on who can use them and, and who the potential students can be? 
Yeah, great question. So ultimately, I think everyone should be able to uh, contribute to a 529 plan. It's, it's an eligible vehicle for basically everyone. Grandparents can save for their grandchildren. Parents can save for their children. You can save for nieces and nephews. Um, so it really is something that is able to be utilized for pretty much any uh, individual that is going to be faced with having to pay for college uh, later down the road. A question that often comes up is, well, I've got two kids. Does that mean that I can put all of the money in one account, or should I open separate 529 plans for each child? So so the answer to that question is, is that you want to be able to uh, set up an account for each child, because you also get additional tax deductions for each deposit that you make for each child, assuming that it's, you're using a plan that's in your state. So what I really see is like grandma and grandpa will set up an account for uh, Jim and Jane uh, in their in their states. And then the parents will set up separate accounts for Jim and Jane. And so you really see a situation where there's four different accounts for the two children and the whole family is contributing to those plans and they're all getting uh, tax breaks as a result. Okay. And are these types of plans the prepaid types or the savings types? Let's differentiate those two just so folks understand that there are some options, some like fundamental options on these 529 plans. Yeah. So that's really the first fork in the road. And that's the way that I like to describe it uh, to my clients. So the first decision is do you use a prepaid plan or do you use a savings plan? And here's the difference. A prepaid plan really does not have any risk to the individual who's contributing to that account in the sense that you are locking in today's rates and you're basically guaranteeing yourself that the, that the tuition increases in the future, the state will cover. And so let's say that on average, uh, college tuition is rising maybe 5% a year. So that really makes it that you're having a risk-free return of 5% in these prepaid plans. So that's really enticing to individuals that really maybe don't have the temperament for the stock market. As a difference is the savings plan, where the state isn't assuming any risk. The individual who's owning the account for the beneficiary is investing in typically mutual funds that are invested in the stock market primarily especially as they're younger. And so there's a lot more risk, but in counter to that, they also have the opportunity to make a higher rate of return. So I think that's the fundamental thing that an individual needs to uh, really pause on and say, look, do I want to go for a higher rate of return, maybe seven, eight, nine, ten 10%, knowing that there's a little bit more risk there? Or do you just say, I want to have a prepaid plan and I want no risk, and I just want to basically offhand all of the future increases of college t- tuition uh, to the state. And there's no wrong answer there. There's absolutely no wrong answer. It's just a matter of what does that individual feel comfortable doing. Talk to me about what might be a downside with a prepaid plan. Let's say you're assuming that a child is going to go to a college in state and you're prepaying there, and all of a sudden, you know, they get into Harvard or they get into some great school, and now you're thinking, wow, maybe, you know, the in state school is not the best choice. Is there an option to move that money? Or are you pretty much stuck with the school that you're prepaying to? Well, so you're prepaying to the state. Um, and in for those state colleges. Um, and it becomes a little bit more of an issue in terms of how much money you're going to get from the state if your child goes out of state to another university or let alone a private institution out of the state. Secondarily, what it's also important to note is that there are far fewer states that have prepaid plans as it, as, as it pertains also in contrast to savings plans. Virtually every state has a savings plan, but I believe only 10 states have uh, currently have prepaid tuition plans and accepting new applicants. So uh, that there's far fewer options in that in that realm. 
Right. So it's really going to depend where you live, what your options are. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, In terms of shopping for these plans, let's assume that listeners are going to go with a savings plan. And you mentioned that most states have them. Does it automatically mean that you should go with the plan that is in your state? We know that there are definitely some benefits to doing that, but would you say that's always the case? No, definitely not. It's not always the case. So, um, you know, there's a, fir- there's a few things that would kind of make me pause in recommending uh, that an individual use their state plan. And the biggest one, from my vantage point, is if it is a broker sold plan, that means there's usually commissions and expenses involved with each deposit that you make, which is, a, is, a, is just a non-starter. So from that standpoint, um, like Virginia, for instance, one of the ones they have is College America. And to get in there, you have to go through a broker and pay commissions to do that. And so I just don't think that makes any sense when there's other plans. Now, to go outside of Virginia, then you lose the tax benefit. So that's not great in terms of the deductions that you get for making contributions. So you have to really kind of look at the expenses that are involved with each of these plans. Now, what that what that also means is that take a second look at these plans that are sold through brokers because there are options to get into them without having to pay these commissions. You just have to work with an advisor that is willing to do that for you. So I'll give you a case in point and I can use my own children as a result because I have three uh, young boys under the age of five and each of them has the, the College America plan. That's because I can get those monies in there without a a, a a load or a commission involved with that. And so just because that is broker sold just means take a second look to see if there is a way to get in it and without a commission. And, but if there is not, or you're not able to find an advisor that'll work with you, then I, I, I strongly recommend not doing that. So then you kind of take a step back and say, okay, well, where would then be the second best place to go if it's not in my state? And there's a lot of resources out there for people to kind of research um, where there's great plans. From my vantage point and looking at all of these state plans, the one that really looks awesome to me is Wisconsin. So um, from that, from there, what you do is you want to look at the plan and say, is there a solid history of high returns on the investments? Are there low management fees? Is there a long and kind of diverse <clears throat> list? of funds and portfolios to choose from? Uh, is it easy to get information off of those websites and, um, and online tools and provide a lot of flexibility on how to choose uh, how much you want to invest? If you can distill those factors, it does lead you into a couple plans like the Wisconsin, like Illinois. They have all of these. And it's great because you can then also say, okay, do I want to go through and have really low cost passive indexes to invest in? Or do I, am I of the philosophy that active management is where I want to be, even though it's a little bit more expense and try to beat the indexes? And so they have all of these plans available to you. You can just pick and choose what works for your family the most. And it's, it is, it's excellent. It's really well thought out. That's great. So I just want to reinforce the point that you're making here that even if you live in a totally different state, let's say you live in Florida, you can invest in another plan like Wisconsin or Illinois and even have a child that may go to a different school. So you could be investing in Wisconsin and then they could end up in school in California, right? So there's a lot of mixing and matching going on here. And I think a lot of people get tripped up with this. They think, okay, I can only invest in the Wisconsin plan if I live in Wisconsin and if my child ends up going to school in Wisconsin, but that's not the case. Not the case at all. And it's great because if you really look into it, you don't have to even worry about the, the child going to a, a school in your state. You know, the, the, the Department of Education has like 400 different universities outside the United States that you're allowed to go to um, and still qualify for the distributions without any penalties. And so I see students going to trade schools. I see st- students going to community colleges, let alone graduates and international schools. But as long as they're um, accredited, then even uh, universities online, like the University of Phoenix, 
um, will, will be institutions that meet the definitions of a, an accredited university and the distributions are completely tax-free as long as they're going to expenses that uh, are associated with the student. So it's, it's really flexible, really very flexible. And let's talk a little bit more about the types of expenses that you can use a 529 for. Obviously, there's tuition and books. Um, What other types of expenses might come up that you can use a 529 for? Um, So uh, a big one is computers. Uh, Another big one is like room and board. Even if it's out out of the university's campus, there's a daily rate that, uh, or a monthly rate that uh, off-campus housing costs can qualify to, that as long as it's up to the allowance for room and board that the college includes in the cost of attendance for federal financial aid purposes. So, you know, basically it's room and board, tuition, books, computers, and, and that's one difference to go back from the um, prepaid to the savings. The savings has a much broader definition of what qualifies as an, a, as an expense. The prepaid is really just room, board, and tuition. There's no uh, accommodation for things like computers and so on and so forth. What happens if your child doesn't go to school? For whatever reason, you've got a situation where a child uh, doesn't want to go to school or perhaps uh, just maybe even wants to delay school. What happens to the money in the 529 plan? Yeah, so that's um, it's really interesting. There's no time frame that this money has to be spent. So let's hope that this child decides that they want to at some point in the future, then that money will still be there even if they're much older than you would expect going to college. We put that in the 20s or 30s. The other thing is, let's just pretend for a moment that the student does want to go to college but just gets a free ride. Now you're sitting with a 529 plan that's fully funded but costs are not there. So what I really see is then these 529s turn into, I would say, like an education legacy from the, to the next generation for basically the grandchildren. So, because again, since there's no time frame, you can then transfer the beneficiary to a future grandchild that will be born later down the road. And there's, no, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. So you could see, and I do see money, that's inside of these tax-deferred accounts for decades. And that becomes a very powerful tool for transferring that money to the next generation without any income tax. No, it's out of the estate, so there's no estate tax if that's a concern. But yet the owners still control the asset and it's not irrevocably given to the children. So it's so your question is great. The, the issue is there's no real downside. Now, if you do come to a situation where the right thing is, is that you have to take the money out for whatever reason. Maybe it's the support of this child uh, for some form or reason other than college. Then what happens is, is that the growth of the money, not what you put in, not the basis, but the growth of that money will be taxed at the owner's federal and state rate plus a 10% penalty. So the, so the IRS really goes out of their way to make this thing, this vehicle, the 529 vehicle, exceptional. But it's with the caveat that the money does get used for education down the road. Um, And if it doesn't, then they're going to apply a a penalty on that. What about financial aid with these accounts? Do you see any downside with amassing a big balance in a 529 plan and, and how that may affect the ability to get financial aid? Uh, absolutely, yes. So the biggest problem is is that, well, so there's there's the answer is yes and no. The yes part is, is that what happens is that a lot of grandparents are saving for their grandchildren in addition to the parents saving. And when it comes time to fill out the FAFSA form, which is stands for the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. The way that the calculations are done, if grandma and grandpa are the owners, it counts as a as income to those children, and it really reduces the amount of financial aid that they can get. Whereas in contrast, 
if mom and dad own the same amount, it is considered an asset, but it doesn't count nearly as heavily in the computations for the amount of financial aid uh, that the uh, young individual can qualify for. So what you should be thinking about, and all the readers should, uh, listeners should be thinking about, is that when it, you have a student that's probably like a junior in high school, if the grandparents have set up these plans, they should change the ownership to the parents so that when it comes time to fill out these the FAFSA form, all of that money is now owned by the parents and there won't be any negative consequences in these calculations. So it's, it's not something that they, the grandparents need to do now because if they're contributing, you want them to be able to get the tax deduction, but when it comes time for that a uh, young child to get ready to go to college, it's best to push the money into the owner, change the ownership to the parents. And then uh, there's also an ease of making the distributions, meaning you don't have to coordinate with who's covering what bill. It's just all in one pile. It's been consolidated and the parents can pay the bills directly to the college. Yeah, that's a great tip. That's very important to think about uh, how, how these large accounts may affect your ability to get financial aid and to do what you can within the legal limits to make sure that you are eligible for as much as possible. In order to avoid any gift taxes, that's limited to $14,000 a year per individual. So for me and my wife, we can contribute $28,000 to each of our three children's 529 plans and have no negative gift tax associated with that. And then on top of that, then our, my, you know, my parents or my wife's parents can make contributions into separate uh, plans. So ultimately, you know, I think you want to have a talk with everybody. This is one of these conversations that needs to happen at the family level to make sure that a, everyone is able to contribute, that would be great, but you also want to make sure that you don't overfund these 529 plans because then you get in a situation where um, you're kind of stuck. I mean, if the child goes through four years of undergraduate and they don't spend all the money, then you're really forced into a situation to say, look, you know, we have to then look at uh, maybe transferring that to another child, um, someone in the family. Uh, or you have to look at maybe then uh, taking that long view that we talked about earlier, which is maybe, you know, start to think about the grandchildren down the road. Um, so I, I just counsel my clients all the time to not overfund. And that becomes, that becomes really the ultimate question I think all people have is, how much should we have in this 529 plan for, you know, each child? And that's the rub, because you don't know where they're going to go. So if they go to an in-state program that costs fifteen to twenty thousand dollars a year, that's one number. But if they decide to go to, you know, NYU, which I've had one of my clients, that's a hundred thousand dollars a year. And so, you know, how do you know where your child's going to go fifteen years from now? And you really can't answer that. So, I think that what what the the, the listeners should be thinking about is, look, we will if we are going to approach this, let's let's approach it that we are going to try to fund, at a minimum, four years of undergraduate in-state. And there's a lot of tools online to figure out what that number would probably be in the future based upon each child's age. There's a lot of online tools and calculations for that. And they'll also then tell you, you know, how much you have to save per, per month. But I, I really wouldn't take it a, 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 the burden of, geez, we're going to have, you know, private institutions at Harvard costing $50,000, $60,000 a year. Um, that's something that I don't think uh, is a wise decision. You can save additional money on the side and put it in your, jo you know, the joint account uh, or a savings account um, and have the flexibility to utilize those assets. But I don't think you necessarily want to look at potentially having to face, you know, 10 percent penalties down the road for overfunding. What other common mistakes or misconceptions do you find among your clients who are interested in 529 plans? I'd say I've seen two big no-no mistakes. Um, the first one is kind of a timing mistake, meaning 
the way that the, the IRS looks at it, they look at these expenses and the distributions from the 529 plans on a calendar year. But sometimes these bills come in at the tail end of a year and the distributions come out at the beginning of the following year and there's a mismatch. Then you walk into the trap of, shoot, now we have to pay federal and state income tax and a 10% penalty even though we had a real expense but it was last year and we just happened to make the distribution the following year. So you have to make sure that these distributions always pair up because that's, those expenses are going to be attached to, the, to the, uh, you know, the tax return and so they qualify as tax-free distributions. So that's the first one. The second one is, and this goes back to why I think the money should be consolidated at the end of the day, but I've seen where grandparents take a distribution and the parents take a distribution for the same expense. And so that then comes into double dipping uh, from different owners of the same beneficiary. And again, you walk into that same issue of, oh my gosh, now we thought we were going to have tax-free distributions and that isn't the case. So those are probably the most common pitfalls um, of using a 529 plan. Other than that, they're, they're fabulous. Christopher, anything else that we should know about 529 plans that we haven't mentioned already? Again, I think the first fork in the road is, you know, do you want to assume the risk? And that just goes back to the temperament of the individual who's saving for college. Um, and if, if you can and you're okay with that, you know, I, I think the savings plans are the way to go. I, I use them for my three children. I do not use the prepaid plans. Um, and, you know, uh, it's been working really great. So I think that's ultimately what your listeners need to understand is that you just have these really robust vehicles at your disposal and any amount that you can save and put into your state plan and get a tax deduction and have the money grow tax deferred and tax free distributions, it's a home run. If listeners are interested in getting a 529 plan, what's the first step? What's the very first thing they need to do? Educate themselves. So um, I, I going online and go to collegesavings.com. Uh, there's really great resources in terms of educating yourself about these plans. They're easy to read. Um, it's not like you have to have a degree in finance to understand them. Um, and from there, with that kind of educational uh, foundation that's strong, you can kind of make really good educated decisions about what's the right course of action for your family. Christopher, where can the listeners learn more about you? Uh, well, our website is always the best, cassaday.com, C-A-S-S-A-D-A-Y.com. Uh, um, and, you know, take a look at our, our website. We have a lot of tools there. We're fiduciaries over our clients' money, so we're not here to sell anybody anything. It's here just to provide objective, impartial advice. Uh, and it's really just an academic exercise for us and how to kind of solve the questions that everybody has. And one of them is always college savings. Terrific. This is fantastic information. I hope that everyone who's listening with young kids or even older kids will consider how they're going to pay for college and consider using a 529 to get the job done. And you don't have to put huge sums in these. You can begin to put small contributions over time that will add up. And, you know, it's peace of mind that you'll have at least some amount of their college expenses right there, ready at your fingertips to be able to withdraw and, and make those payments for whatever bills come in. Christopher, thank you so much. This is great information. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me today. My pleasure, Laura. I hope this interview helped you understand more about the ins and outs of using a 529 plan. One point that I do want to make before we go is that you should never put your kid's college ahead of your own retirement. And I know that can be difficult to hear. There are many ways that you or your child can pay for college, such as scholarships, work-study programs, and loans. Unfortunately, no one is going to give you a scholarship or a loan for retirement outside of a meager Social Security retirement benefit. And as we know, that program may have a shaky future. In an ideal world, you'd be able to save for both your own future and college. However, if you're forced to make a trade-off, fund your retirement first by investing a minimum of 10 to 15% of your gross income. Then you'll be in a better financial position 
to help a child who may need it later on. To keep the money conversation going with a terrific community, join my private Facebook group called Dominate Your Dollars. To request your invitation, visit Dominate Your Dollars on Facebook or send me a text message for immediate access. Just text DOLLARS to the number 33444. I'll see you in the group. You can also visit lauradadams.com to email me your money question feedback about the show, or ideas for future episodes. If you're enjoying the show, let me know by subscribing and taking a minute to submit a quick five-star review on iTunes. That's all for now. I'll talk to you next week, courtesy of Money Girl, your guide to a richer life.